Greetings and welcome. My name is Annette Vegas and I'm a staff anesthesiologist from Toronto, Canada. I would like to thank the organizers for the kind invitation to speak briefly today on the topic of current state of cardiac transplant anesthesia. I have no conflict of interest. This talk will highlight changes in heart transplantation anesthesia related to epidemiology, recipients, donors, and the diagnosis and management of specific intraoperative problems of vasoplegia, right ventricular dysfunction, primary graft dysfunction, and blood management. The limited management options for stage D heart failure patients include mechanical circulatory support and heart transplantation. This graph compares two-year outcomes for medical management, pulsatile and continuous flow VADs and heart transplantation, which has a superior outcome and remains the best option. Though VADs are readily available, complications give patients only a five-year survival of 41% compared to heart transplantation at 72%, making VADs a limited option in heart failure patients. Fortunately, after plateauing for many years, heart transplant numbers have risen slightly in the last few years to 5,700 in 2017. According to recent ISHLT data, heart transplant recipients are older, have a diagnosis of non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, are more sensitized, and often bridged with mechanical support. This impacts the intraoperative and postoperative care of recipients. Comparing recipient characteristics show potentially a fitter recipient as more patients come from home with fewer on IV inotropes. Newer generation continuous flow LVADs avoid death and improve eligibility, successfully bridging up to 45% of heart transplant patients. Unfortunately, not all patients with VADs survive to transplant, as 12% die awaiting transplant and 30% become ineligible due to complications. Despite use in the crash and burn heart failure patient, ECMO as a bridge to transplant plays only a minor role. Heart transplant donor criteria have also changed in an effort to expand the donor pool. This includes using marginal donors and optimizing donor management. Marginal donors may have minor heart dysfunction and increasingly come from patients with substance abuse. Donation after circulatory death or DCD donation is used in some countries to expand the donor pool by up to 30%. Perfusion of the DCD heart may be from direct procurement and ex vivo perfusion or in situ normothermic regional perfusing, perfusion using ECMO. Novel transport devices such as the Sherpa pack and organ care system may safely extend the organ ischemic time. Let's pause to consider anesthesia and surgery for heart transplantation. There have been few advances in anesthesia drugs and surgical technique. What has changed is we are managing a fitter recipient receiving a marginal or DCD heart. Common interoperative problems require early recognition and management, such as vasoplegia, RV dysfunction, primary graft dysfunction, and bleeding. Anesthesia assessment for the heart transplant patient is expeditious and identifies the emergency surgery with a full stomach. Heart failure etiology and current status, including secondary organ involvement, redo cardiac surgery and sternotomy, presence of permanent pacemaker or AICD, which requires deactivation. The patient should not have pre-existing high pulmonary vascular resistance. Heart failure management may involve medical tailoring or bridging with mechanical support. The remainder includes focused physical and lab data review. The timing of induction tries to minimize the graft ischemic time. In most centers, the patient will enter the OR but await induction until after inspection of the donor heart. Explantation of the recipient heart occurs after the donor heart arrives in the hospital. 
Anesthesia induction and maintenance adheres to institutional practice. Standard and invasive monitors and DFib pads are applied prior to induction. The goal is a hemodynamically stable induction that minimizes PVR and maintains bad flow using various medications. Often existing inotropes, pressors, and devices are continued in the pre-CPB period. Steroids are administered pre-induction and at reperfusion. Heparin resistance may be present. Specific concerns with weaning from cardiopulmonary bypass are administering steroids at reperfusion, de-airing the donor heart guided by TEE, allowing a generous amount of time for reperfusion. The denervated heart requires a fast heart rate and normal sinus rhythm using medications such as isoproturinol or pacing, an adequate preload and maintenance of contractility. Importantly, strategies are employed that optimize RV function. Cardiac vasoplegia syndrome is unexpected refractory hypotension during or immediately after CPB from a severe SERS response related to vasodilatation and catecholamine resistance. It may complicate weaning despite adequate cardiac function. There is no consensus definition, but the diagnosis includes hemodynamic findings in the presence of adequate fluids and vasopressor requirements. VPS has an incidence of 30% and a high morbidity and mortality rate. Many risk factors are associated with VPS and these have changed over time. Identifying the patient at risk may allow for preemptive or the early introduction of treatment. Treatment goals in VPS are to restore an adequate circulation to prevent worsening and organ function. The target mean arterial pressure of greater than 65 is from the sepsis literature. As with most forms of shock, volume replacement is key to successful management. Discontinue vasodilators such as propofol and milrinone, which exacerbate the hypotension. Early pharmacotherapy involves standard drugs such as catecholamine, vasopressin, and methylene blue. Novel agents such as vitamin C, thiamine, hydroxycopolamine, and angiotensin II agonist may buy time until the SERS resolves. The donor RV is vulnerable in the recipient as it must perform after incurring a reperfusion injury from prolonged ischemic time and air and pump against an elevated PVR. Early recognition of RV dysfunction from direct inspection, hemodynamic data, and echocardiographic findings enables early treatment. An experienced cardiac anesthesiologist, we are all familiar with the basics of managing preload, contractility, afterload, and maintaining coronary perfusion. If the RV continues to struggle, prompt introduction of mechanical support, such as an RVAD or ECMO, is advocated. Primary graft failure is defined as severe ventricular dysfunction without surgical or immunological causes such as a hyperacute rejection that occurs less than 24 hours after heart transplantation. PGF may occur as early as the post-reperfusion phase and prevent weaning from cardiopulmonary bypass. The severity of PGF is defined by specific criteria as listed here. Risk factors for PGF include donor, recipient, and procedural factors as listed. Marginal and DCD donors, recipient age, LVAD, and reoperation and transfusion are frequent risk factors. Management has evolved over the years from pharmacological to immunosuppression and plasmapheresis, and now to the early use of mechanical support in the form of ECMO. Finally, bleeding is ubiquitous with most cardiac procedures and heart transplantation is no exception with risk factors as indicated. Preoperative anticoagulation may involve reversal of warfarin, NOAC, and antiplatelet agents. Interoperative blood management has evolved and is often institutional specific. 
Nevertheless, established pillars include the use of cell saver, antifibrinolytics, and DDAVP. Point of care testing and a validated transfusion algorithm to direct transfusion of blood and recombinant products. So in summary, heart transplantation remains the best option for survival in heart failure. Recipients and donors have changed. Anesthesia and surgical techniques are unaltered. Early recognition and management of vasoplegia, heart, right heart failure, primary graft failure, and bleeding is important. Thank you very much.